Welcome and bienvenue. My name is Rosanna Riley Runta. I'm president and CEO of the Canada Foundation for Innovation, La Fondation Canadienne pour l'Innovation. On behalf of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, I'm delighted to welcome you to the first big thinking event at this 91st Congress of the Humanities and Social Sciences, where Onawa MacIver and Gadarone Iris Stady, Stacy, a partner of the Netona One Mind, One People project, will speak about radical reclamation of Indigenous languages. J'aimerais signaler que cette séance se déroulera en anglais. Today's event will take place in English and American Sign Language. Il y aura l'interprétation simultanée en français. There will also be closed captioning in English et bien sûr en français. An ASL interpreter should be appearing on your Zoom screen. For simultaneous interpretation, please go to the bottom of your Zoom screen where it says interpretation. To turn on the English closed captioning, please navigate to the bottom of the screen, click on closed captioning, and you will find it under settings. Pour le français, veuillez bien choisir le lien dans la boîte de conversation, Zoom. This information will again appear in the chat during the event for people who join us later on. I am speaking to you now from my home in Ottawa, Ontario. And I wish to acknowledge that the Canada Foundation for Innovation and the Federation, which are virtually hosting us today, are both located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. As we gather virtually, I would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands we are on today. While we meet on this virtual platform, let us take a moment to recognize the importance of the land on which we each are located. We acknowledge the territory to reaffirm our commitment and our responsibility in building positive relations between nations and in developing a deep understanding of indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all Inuit, First Nations, and Métis peoples. The Canada Foundation for Innovation has long supported the Big Thinking series at Congress. We have done this because we appreciate the power of ideas and research to help address the big issues of our time. And on behalf of the Fed Federation for Humanities and Social Sciences, I would like to thank the sponsors for the Big Thinking Congress 2022 series, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, Universities Canada, and the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the Conseil de Recherche en Sciences Humaines du Canada, Université Canada, et la Fondation Canadienne pour l'Innovation. On this first day of Congress 2022, the Big Thinker Speaker Series will lead to deeply illuminating conversations on this year's theme, Transitions on Decolonization and Indigenous Language Revitalization. The theme of Transitions implies movement forward. And on this, the CFI's 25th anniversary, we share a spirit of looking forward and a focus on contributing to a better future for us all. It is a great honor to welcome Onawa MacIver, Professor in Indigenous Education at the University of Victoria and co-lead of the Nat National Netolno Research Partnership. Joining her in discussion is Gadarini, Gadarini Iris Stacy one of the partners in the project. She is the curriculum team coordinator for the Kanawaki Education Center, and she is a Vanier Scholar and PhD candidate at McGill University. We are delighted to have this opportunity to learn from their inspiring work to revitalize Indigenous languages. Following the presentation, 
you are invited to a discussion with both of them, and they will be able to answer a few audience questions. You can submit the questions by typing them in the question and answer box. And you can also participate in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Big Thinking and Congress H. Dr. McIver was recently interviewed for an article in the University of Victoria News. In it, she describes her research in moving terms. She says, indigenous languages are filled with beauty like great works of art and hold much wisdom through philosophical views, cultural values, and ways of living. She goes on to explain, we are looking at where language revitalization is working and the impact it's having on people's lives. And she concludes by saying, it is really a pedagogy of hope. And with that beautiful message of optimism, I turn it over to Dr. MacGyver. I'm going to turn it over to Kathroni to introduce herself first. Watu no hora de zewa guego. Gata heroni, Ira Stacy ni waxanoda. Wagen yahto dano gahna wageni do wageno. Wagatsenoni diga iges o wa wan nizerade. Welcome everyone. I'm Gata heroni Ira Stacy. I'm of the Ganyak Gahaga Nation Turtle Clan from Gahnawage, Mohawk Territory. I'm a Haudenosaunee woman, a mother, and Doda. I've always had pride in being from my community as I come from a large family who ensure to have a strong connection to the land, our river, and the people of Gahnawage. I lead my family with traditional longhouse ways at the heart of my family. I'm a second language speaker and I've put much effort into raising my children to be proud Kanyakahaga. I've been, they've been my inspiration as I've been involved in education and language revitalization in my community for many years, wearing many hats along the way. Presently, I'm the curriculum team coordinator at the Kahnawaga Education Center, and I'm honored to be here today. Nyamakoa for listening in. Hey, hey. We wanted to start with these images of our families and Katharoni just spoke to her family in connection to her lands and the languages of her lands. <clears throat> and on the right hand side of the slide, I'm sharing some photographs of Negewepan, Nogompan, Nomosompan. These are my late relatives, my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather, and they ground us in the work that we do. And you've heard the nations that we come from. My family comes from Norway House Cree Nation and Cross Lake Cree Nation in Northern Manitoba. And this is a reminder of the work, why we do the work we do. So these photographs ground me and they remind me every day why I do the work that I do. My grandparents were speakers of our language and they didn't pass the language on to my mother and her siblings. This is the story of our family, but it is the story of many, many families. It's a common story in Canada. But the picture of Metansak, my daughters, in the top left-hand corner is a message of hope. So the work is founded on loss, but also on hope. And so we share these intimate and close to our heart pictures with you so that you understand and hopefully come along on this journey with us today about why we do the work that we do. Hi, hi. Next, we'll, I want to begin with acknowledging the two territories uh, that Gatharoni and I are sitting today. Um, she said that she's in, the, in her homelands of the Ganawage people, and I am here in the homelands of the Hassanich and the Kwangan people, the Sinchathan and the Kwangan speaking people. I am a visitor here in these territories. But I also want to invite you to take a moment to acknowledge the territories where you're sitting, to feel the earth beneath your feet, the vibrations of the lands and the waters of the area that you are presently living. It might be the area where you were born. Maybe you were 
transformed or transplanted in that area some time ago, or maybe you're very recently um, moved to the place that you are. But taking this moment, a deep breath, to feel the land beneath you, and to know that there are languages that belong to the land where you're sitting today. And those languages are thriving or aspiring to thrive. And we're here to remember and honor those languages today. And so thank you for being here with us. And we hope to take you on a journey of our scholarship and the network that we've built and are continuing to build and really offer Kananaska Mutnawao my thanks to all of you for being here with us today. Hi, hi. Next, we're going to talk about why. Um, so this is just a, a, a starting point. We need to, Katharine and I talked about uh, this talk that we were invited to do and we thought, you know, it's really important to take a moment to remember why the field of language revitalization exists. So the field of language revitalization is relatively new um, by the standards of humanities and social sciences and it's becoming accepted as a new field of study. And on one hand that can feel like, oh, we're one of the club and you know, our scholarship is being acknowledged and it is different. It has roots in education and linguistics and, and other uh, branches of scholarship. But the heart of the matter is really that our field only exists because of the history of this country of the intentional, historic, violent erasure of Indigenous languages. And it's important for us to acknowledge that. We might be uncomfortable at times with the history of our nation, but we're also getting comfortable with Indigenous language revitalization as an activity, as a celebrated field, as a celebrated undertaking. And while that's not a bad thing, we have to remember why we're doing the work that we're doing. Beyond that, it's also important to remember that this is not only historic. There, there is an ongoing hostile environment towards Indigenous languages in Canada. And that is the truth. That is true for Indigenous people. If you talk to anybody who's working in the field of language revitalization, they will tell you that they're fighting an uphill battle when it comes to acknowledgement as the first languages of the country, creating space for our languages, fighting for resources for the return of our languages. So acknowledging that ongoing difficulty is also critically important. So for those of you who attend to the work laid out in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, for instance, who worked for many, many years and left some calls to action for you, this is the truth part. And we tend to skip over that sometimes and fast forward to reconciliation. We're sometimes more comfortable with thinking about what can we do, but it's really important for us to pause and acknowledge the truth even when it makes us uncomfortable because then we can have a conversation in an honest space because we're experiencing it. We can't shy away from it. We experience it every day. So we need, we're as, asking other Canadians to join us in that space. Next, we're going to introduce uh, the partnership that Gatharoni and I are a part of. We knew each other before. Uh, this partnership began. But the purpose of sharing this with you today is that this is essentially a response. This is a response to that why. So that why does the field of language revitalization exist? Why are these activities necessary? This is our response. This is a collective response. This is a national network that we've built, that we're continuing to build. It's Indigenous-led, Indigenous-governed, and that's really critical to the work that we do. It's foundational to the guiding principles of what we built together. It wasn't anybody's 
big idea university professors um, going out and putting this on top of you know a community. It was truly built from the ground up together with communities and we never would have done it if we didn't have community partners that were equally interested in doing this together with us. It's a seven year SHRC funded partnership grant. We're in the sixth of seven years. So we've got two years left. We're just right at the beginning of year six. And there's nine partners. This partnership is founded in knowing, sharing, gathering strength across language groups and communities. And it's founded in hope. That was one really critical founding principle that our partners shared with us. They said, you know, we, the, the last dying speaker is always makes the front cover. But what about the places where people are having successes? What about the places where we're gaining traction, where we've been doing this work for 20 or 30 years and we actually have new speakers of the language like Catherine, like the other members of her community and people in her family. So this is a map uh, that we created to show folks the nine different partners across the nation who have joined us in this endeavor. Um, we attempted a kind of coast to coast to coast um, representation. Our farthest north partner is the Decho First Nation in the Northwest Territories. I'm over here on the West Coast and we have the Xanich First Nation on whose territory I'm sitting today as well as the First Peoples Cultural Council. Over uh, to the East Coast we have Mi'kmaq partners who are doing just wonderful work and um, six part six, five, six partners in between. Now, what's important about this map is to understand that it is not representational of all the communities in Canada. We couldn't um, find partners in every single region at the time that we were building it. And so it's not meant to be representational of, of every single region, but we have other ways that we've built into the partnership where people can be included. The next slide is a photograph of one of our partnership gatherings. And what's important to me about this slide is that it's important to remember that there's real people behind this because we can share models and share um, websites and text slides, but these are the people who have come together, who made this commitment, who are doing phenomenal language reclamation, resurgence, maintenance and revitalization work in their communities, in their home territories with multi-generational efforts. And this is one of the gatherings that we had back in 2019 mm -hmm. um, in the Northwest Territories with one of our partners, the Decho First Nations, just before we weren't allowed to meet again <laughs> for a long time. So we've been meeting virtually, uh, probably like many of you and like this session here today, but feeling hopeful about the possibility of meeting again uh, later this year. The last slide that I'm going to share with you today is to show you um, what I think about as kind of the theoretical framework for our partnership grant work, the research work. So when we started to build the grant, which happened in 2016, so the year before you get it, we traveled all around to the different community partners uh, that joined us. We had Zoom calls, uh, phone calls, and these different ideas started to come together. And as it was coming together, like lots of good indigenous research, I started to draw a picture on the back of a napkin. So I one day would like to write a paper called Paper Napkin Diaries because I think a lot of the best research ideas happen like this in cafes and, and um, at least for indigenous researchers, it happens that way. But as it was coming together, it started to feel like a house to me. So we have the foundation of the house, which is links between language health and well-being. We have the theme of assessment. Assessment work is really critically important in language learning and language revitalization. The two colored blocks to the left and the right, sites of language learning and teaching and sites of contribution. This is really the heart of the home. 
So I think about these as like the kitchen and the living room. So in the kitchen where all the action happens are the places where adult language learners are learning the language, this list is not exhaustive, but also the sites that they're contributing. Because what happens in our communities is that as soon as an adult learner shows any propensity towards learning, kind of puts their hand up or says, sure, I'll come to that program, they're almost immediately thrown into a contribution role where they're suddenly teaching in the language nest or suddenly helping with curriculum development um, or a teaching assistant in some other way. And so this interplay between sites of language and learning and sites of contribution are critically important. The roof of the house is adult language learning. That is the theme that binds this network together we do have a focus on adult language learning. And the reason for that is that we have come to realize over the years, a group of, of researchers and community-based practitioners is that we have far too few adult speakers and especially adult speakers who are of working age, childbearing age. Most of our speakers, a lot of our speakers are becoming elderly. And so there needs to be a specific and special focus on the creation of new adult speakers. And the last uh, part of this um, model is the NILA project. That's the red bar going along the top, the ceiling of the, of the house. And that's going to be a virtual network that we'll be launching this year. And that's a way that any community, any individual, any organization, post-secondary organization can join us and be part of a map, part of a network, part of learning groups, um, contribute and attend and connect with other people across Canada and North America beyond who are doing similar work. Um, so that's the overview of the big project that we have underway. Um, although we're on the sunset of the grant, we still have lots of really important work ahead. It's very exciting that we're getting to learn from each other and some of the themes are coming together. We've developed some research clusters now where partners are meeting on a monthly basis and sharing some of the outcomes and emerging outcomes from the research projects that they're doing. So thank you again for being here for our talk. And I'm going to turn it over now to Katharoni, who's going to share with you her perspective as a community partner and a language champion. Hi, hi. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to share my experiences being part of the Natalpnu Research Partnership. My participation has been both as a graduate student and as a representative of the Gahnawage Education Center. In Gahnawage, we have been implementing many efforts to re towards revitalization and reclaiming our language, beginning as early as 1970 with the introduction of Ganyageha at the elementary level for 15 minutes per day. Throughout the work and dedication of community advocates, through efforts quickly expanded. Those visionaries who are our, our elders who began the language movement in Gahnawage literally built the foundation of our programs today, one piece of paper at a time. I recall Gadiwahawe, Dorothy Lazor, sharing her experiences, saying they didn't even have one piece of paper when they began. So the development of teaching materials, texts, and even a standardized orthography were truly groundbreaking successes for Ganyageha language revitalization and reclamation. Fast forward to 2022, we have many initiatives and successes to celebrate. Our efforts are persi persistent. However, the number of first language Ganyageha speakers continues to decline. As our community's strategic language plan highlights, the challenges in raising up new speakers are still apparent. So as a community, and actually as the Ganyagahaga Nation, we're stepping up our efforts once again and working through cross-community collaborations. Our community Ganyageha immersion programs have proven to be the most impactful for Gahnawage thus far. This includes the Radiwanah Nirat's full-time adult immersion program 
that produces a growing demographic of advanced skin language speakers. Those graduates uh, of which I've, I am one, uh, then go on to contribute to overall efforts as Onawa mentioned. They're leading and facilitating unique programs such as the Yagwa Huazira Daje Language Nest and the Yagwa Runka Haje Cultural Camps focused on advanced speakers. They're also implementing innovative language projects, documentation and resource development that bolster community efforts. It's very exciting to see a, another generation of advocates advancing efforts with a common vision to ensure that language and culture of our people will continue to be here into the future. As the Gahnawaga Education Center picture here, um, our elementary immersion program, is facilitated by past graduates of adult immersion programming. And that's where an, our Natal new research is focused on supporting our immersion staff with ongoing professional development opportunities. It's been so uplifting to see teachers engaged in land-based learning, learning the language of the land from elder speakers so they can then share it with our students as richly and authentically as possible. It's been so uplifting to also see um, the example of the types of trainings being offered, such as the, our immersion teacher coach has also been impactful as they work closely with teachers to mentor and support them in their professional goals as teachers and strengthening their Kanyageha proficiency. As a Nungwehunwe graduate student, first at the University of Victoria and my master's for my master's studies, then later at McGill University for my doctoral studies. It's been very re rewarding and definitely challenging. I recall reading the first works, reading the works the first time of uh, Linda Tuhuai Smith, Kathleen Absalon, Carol Cornelius, Gregory Kayete and others. Reading their work, Indigenous Voices felt empowering for me as an Ongwehunwe scholar while at the same time knowing the responsibilities of doing community-based research became, a, became an added pressure to get it right, to represent my community in a good way, to share a bit of our story with the utmost, with respect. So having the opportunity to read and listen to impactful, inspiring, and bold Indigenous scholars to share ideas, to share ideas about Indigenous research and learn from Indigenous scholars and professors such as my co-presenter, Dr. Onao McIver, has been invaluable in my journey within academia. They and many more Ungwehunwe scholars have forged a path ahead and provided examples and encouragement for others coming behind them, reminding one another to always stay true to who, who we are as Ungwehunwe, to think as we do, to think as Ungwehunwe as we do this language work, so we continue to exist as Ungwehunwe people in this world. Despite all that we have endured as Ungwehunwe, we carry on the work of those first visionaries. Being a traditional Haudenosaunee woman, I was empowered to seek out any answers through an Ungwehunwe way of thinking. And that's what I see as integral to research for us and by us, grounded in community, in mentorship and camaraderie, while we strive to center and honor on what am I thinking and doing? So next, I'll, I'll talk about the through the Natal New Project and other scholarly collaborations. I've been fortunate to be part of such an amazing group who are truly experts at what they're doing in each of their communities. We learn from another, one another. We share amongst our communities. Mentorship has been a part of this relationship building as well. Supporting one another to grow, to continue to work and be successful on the pathways that we're on. From analyzing data, data to publishing articles and even to receiving an, an invitation to this very talk. There's mentorship and inspiration in our Natalia relationships. So I'm grateful to be a part of it and to be part of my community efforts. I'll end my part by saying that Natalia is indigenous led and government, governed and it's been important to our success as a partnership. For the KEC, 
It provided a model of Indigenous-led research guided and grounded in community. It sparked dialogue surrounding research. What is research? What harm, harms can it bring to our community? Why, when, and how should we engage in research? It led to a collective shift in understanding about research for us and by us. Conversations sparked the development of our KEC research policy and code of ethics, which is a notable ac accomplishment for the KEC as part of the NATO new partnership. So I'll just wrap up with a few um, closing words. One of the things that happens in the work that Katharine and I do is that we're often asked by non-Indigenous people um, about how they can help. And so this is a, a tool, a resource that I wanted to share with you. Um, it's available on the World Wide Web. Um, you can just Google uh, MacIver and Guide to Indigenous Languages. It's published by CC UNESCO. And there's many, many ways, non-intrusive ways that, that anybody in Canada can assist with this endeavor, with the reclamation and return of Indigenous languages, such as acknowledging place names, demanding language, Indigenous languages to be taught in the schools in your region, learning a greeting and a response. And now you've had a short conversation with somebody in the language of the, the territory that you live in. Um, and there's many other tips on this uh, guide for you as well. To finish, uh, what I want to leave you with is some final thoughts. We've shared with you today one example, Nutanuk is one network. It's a radical reclamation of indigenous languages, a collective of people that is um, open and welcoming to, to others as well. It's a vision of hope and empowerment through research and community practice, the intersection of that. And we do take a stand to ensure the continuation of the first languages of these lands claimed as Canada. And we do invite settler allies to take up their responsibility to have an active role in the continuation and revival of Indigenous languages. I'll paraphrase one of my favorite quotes by one Otsa, Dr. Lorna Williams, who says, if you call yourself a Canadian, these languages are your heritage too. So they should matter to you. It should matter to you that they continue. And I hope that we've left you with a message of hope today, a message of empowerment to join us, to join the people in your region, to contribute in the ways that are appropriate and useful. Um, and really thank you so much. We'll leave you with um, some words of thanks in some of the languages that we work in. Um, and now our team has prepared a short video, it's just three minutes, to share some of the journey, the strength and the beauty of this collective and our efforts to date. Hi, hi.
Miigwech. Thank you so much. Um, this has been inspiring and a beautiful talk. And I know we're going to get lots of questions. And I, in, in my heart, am with you because as a language teacher, where I started my life, I'm always convinced that language carries culture. And uh, without the language, one loses culture and it, it maintains the culture from one generation to the next. There are two questions that, that I kind of start off with. And one is the youth. Um, you know, only uh, the, the elders, actually, one in three are now speaking, uh, but only one in 10 of the youth. And is there a way to look at what youth listen to? Um, songs, radio, uh, television, um, tweets, um, TikTok. Um, are there any efforts uh, to use those uh, technologies to carry the language forward? Yeah, great question. I'll maybe get started and then Catherine, we might want to speak about the, the um, youth in her community because she could say more specifically what's happening there. Uh, youth focus work is, is a big, uh, I would just say it's a focus in our field. Um, it's a really important shift that needs to happen. Uh, some of my, my cohort, I'll say we were teasing each other, uh, you know, just in the last few years of saying we used to be the youth, we were the young ones, you know, the radicals, and now we're becoming middle-aged, you know, we're 40 and so we're not young anymore. So where are the, you know, what, what are we doing? We have to ask ourselves that. Um, so it's not just about elderly speakers, but it's also those of us who are kind of driving the, the um, movement right now that we have a responsibility. So I'll just say for myself that one of the things that I'm trying to do is become more youth focused in the work that I do. So trying to create um, working groups, you know, pay the youth to be there, not always asking for their volunteerism to get them to be coming out to advisories to get them to tell us. I think the worst thing that we can we can do as middle aged people is imagine that we know. So I know that there are, are efforts happening on TikTok for sure. That's a new popular platform. But the most important thing is for us to get youth involved and for them to tell us. Um, other youth, I've seen some great efforts. Um, a young Mi'kmaq woman who translated the word, the song "Blackbird," um, and it's you know a, an internet sensation. And so, you know, following their interests and following their leads. But those of us who are you know middle age and and kind of driving the the field, we need to um, really find ways to engage the youth and listen to them. So I'll just check with Catherine if she wants to say anything more about the youth in her community. Yes, I'll, I'll add that um, when we look at language revitalization, you're, you're right in saying that it's not one generation. It's not all about the elders or the adult language learners. Um, when we look at, at language revitalization, it's definitely um, the goal of having an intergenerational community of speakers. So that includes everyone. I, I can share a, a really a beautiful example that our community is proud of is uh, our Yagwahwajira Dajje language nest that I had mentioned. And there's women who work with supporting um, young mothers and giving them the tools to use the language with their, their children. So I, I love the, the approach that they use and we see them throughout the community and it's the tools that uh, they're providing them to be able to, to empower them as mothers to pass on the language to, to their children. And they do it as a collective and, and they work together and support one another. And that's one, one really nice example that I, I one day, if you ever get to hear them present, uh, you would be uh, amazed at the things that uh, they do. And as well, definitely if we see social media, there's so much of the language being shared and uh, language groups who are sharing about the language, asking how you say things and definitions. And definitely it's an intergenerational uh, approach with uh, everybody working together. About 10 years ago, I had an idea that there should be at every university 
um, indigenous language taught, um, starting at the you know, kind of level 100 and moving up um, so that it wouldn't just be people of indigenous heritage, but as you said, uh, uh, it was would be all of our heritage and that we would all share it. And I, I think it might add pride to it when other people have a value and, and put their own hearts and minds to, to sharing it. Um, when I had that idea 10 years ago, it was impossible because there were not enough teachers that we could get. Um, has that changed? Is there a project? You know, teaching is the best way of learning, but uh, is it a possibility? Can we look for that? Is it a goal that we should espouse? What I would offer in regards to that is I think what hasn't changed is that there are still many communities who have too few speakers to be able to offer that kind of service through a university. So it's going to vary by region, vary by language group greatly. So neither Catherine or I could speak, you know, comprehensively about every language in Canada. Um, but to your point, I do think that um, this, and I will speak for myself, so I am not here as a spokesperson for all Indigenous people in Canada to say that uh, I do think that our movement could be strengthened by greater opportunities for non-Indigenous people to learn our languages when appropriate to do so. So when there are the resources that aren't, you know, taking away from the community efforts, because that's where the home fires have to be burning. The, the fire has to be strong. It can't be just embers and then trying to like steal, you know, the coals from the fire and put them over into the university. Um, but it also has to be done with respect. So we do see sometimes examples where um, folks will take language classes and then they start, then they create resources and sort of publish them and so on. And so people have to do that with respect and not um, take that opportunity and then adopt some kind of ownership over the language. Uh, but I do, I agree with you that I think that greater opportunities for that kind of sharing and embodiment and, you know, taking, taking up the, the language in um, that kind of way, I think could really strengthen the movement. We have a question in the chat that follows up on that. Um, what advice would you give to people who are learning an Indigenous language for the first time? Again, I'll start, but I'll turn it over to Catherine, who's, you know, a learner herself, a teacher. She could speak to this, I'm sure, much more with much greater strength. Um, don't give up. <laughs> That's the biggest thing. I mean, it's any language. It doesn't matter what language you're learning. Language learning is hard. You know, it's really difficult. Um, so don't give up. You know, having that persistence and continuing to stick with it. Uh, the other thing is to try to keep at it a little bit every day, um, no matter how busy your life gets, if you have recordings, if you have um, language materials, or if you are able to work with a speaker or a class to, to get permission to hear, to make recordings, to just hear a little bit each day. Language learning is not something that you can kind of cram. You can't do sort of three hours every Saturday and forget about it the other six hours of, or six days of the week. So those are my two top tips is um, don't give up and try to make space for it in your life every day. Catherine, what are your top tips for new learners? I feel a, a good tip could be to um, build your bubble of support. Um, if you have one friend that you could work with and um motivate each other in as you're learning be aware uh, take note of the resources that, that are at your fingertips um and take full of advantage of them um and be open to different ways of learning um sometimes um for example um if we look at learning uh, a grammar method you know we have um, for most uh, we have polysynthetic languages um so those are some tools that you can be open to, to helping you in your learning. So everything is a tool. Uh, there's not a one, one size fits all for language learning. So be open to trying different ways and um, 
noting what works for you and uh, stick to it, sticking to it. Like Onawa says, it takes time and it's challenging, but rewarding, so rewarding. We've got a lot of questions coming through. Um, one of them is, how do you build allies for learning language? And when you have those allies, how do you um, incorporate evaluation into what your, your community is doing? I guess that's part of the selling point, that it works. <laughs> how do you, how do you um, persuade people of that? I'm going to take the word ally in a broad, in the sense of other people in the community, because we've already talked about non-Indigenous uh, folks. So I, I'm, I don't know the, if that was the nature of the question, but one um, principle that I've taken to this work, and I've said it before, is start with the believers. Start with the people who are indicating interest in your community, other mothers, other parents, other adults, you know, your age, uh, an elder or a speaker who has indicated a, a willingness or an interest in teaching or mentoring. Um, don't start with the hardest people, the hardest nuts to crack. <laughs> Um, in almost every community that I've traveled to, there's even people who still have that kind of colonial view that our languages are dying, that they don't have value. Um, so, you know, you might not ever win them all. So start, you know, and similarly to what Catherine was just talking about is build some protection around yourself, you know, wrap a blanket of warmth and comfort and build out from there. Um, the point around evaluation, I think, is a bit of a different question. And the short way that I would just put that is that, from my perspective, evaluation of our efforts is important. Uh, I think that we've seen lots of examples where people are doing the same thing for 20 or 30 years and maybe not getting the outcomes that they're looking for. So it tells us that evaluation is important, but that does need to be driven by the community. We don't need outside people coming in and telling us how to do things. So those would be my two responses. Okay. So um, the languages are innovating and evolving. All languages do. And um, it's, this is a really hard question because it says, how are some of them innovating and evolving? And we know there's 60 to 70 languages in 12 groups across the country. I, mean, I don't know how you can answer that question, but maybe from your perspective and your experience. Do you want to speak to this one? Sure. I can. Um, I can reflect on our 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 immersion program, for example, um, when we're looking at teaching um, different disciplines and subject areas, creating curriculum to talk about math, to talk about different concepts in um, science, for example. We have to uh, create uh, new vocabulary to describe some of those concepts. So within our languages, we have um, ways of describing and ways of, of putting our languages together and to build uh, dis descriptions of, of what it is we, any concept that we wanna talk about. So even uh, this, it's even described uh, within our standardized um, orthography, uh, the report, uh, the elders give, an, give examples of creating new words and formulating the needed vocabulary. Um, the same thing when we look to technology and the, the, the young people and, and making new words for texting and Zoom. And so we have the mechanisms to do it because our languages are very descriptive. And uh, so we, we can definitely do that. And our languages need to grow in that way so they could continue to be used uh, amongst, you know, moving forward with any change. That is so inspiring and creative. Um, it, it really um, makes me want to go uh, learn a, a lot of vocabulary right now. <laughs> and I just think that, the, that your talk has been filled with hope uh, and uh, positive good efforts that will serve youth and elders, serve communities, your community, but serve everyone in this, this, uh, on this land. So um, on behalf of the Federation for the Humanities and the Social Sciences, 
um, on behalf of the sponsors, the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, and Universities Canada, I would like to thank you and say miigwech from the bottom of my heart. This has been an extraordinary session. And if anyone wants to hear a replay of it, um, that will be available um, on the Congress platform in the, current, in the coming days. This lecture is the first of four at Congress 2022. And we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's lecture on May 13th from 12 to 1 p.m. It's going to have to be terrific to, to uh, beat you. <laughs> the, the lecture is entitled Base, uh, Beyond Crimes of Insolidarity, Considerations for a Transition Based on Economic and Social Rights with Dr. Christine Bezina. And the lecture will take place in French. And I shouldn't say that the lecture would, would, it's not a competition to see which one would be better, but I'm just so amazed that I, I wanna hear this lecture again. And until you do hear it again, you can continue participating using Twitter and the hashtags at Big Thinking and Congress H. Thank you all for joining us today. And I hope I see you at the lecture demain. Merci. Yeah, well.